Well, here we go, folks. Now we're going to jump off into the river, so to speak, tonight. You ready to jump off? Amen. Tonight, actually, will probably be a little bit of history. And uh, I would say next week and the coming weeks, uh, we'll get more into what the book says, what I've written so far of the uh, sign of his coming in the end of the age. But tonight, I want us to look at a couple of things here in Matthew 24. And we've been reading the Matthew 24 as relating to the destruction of the temple. And Jesus telling them, not one stone will be left upon another. And the disciples asked him in verse 3, he said, and as he, as he set up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? And we would probably like to have every message ever preached on this or the time of every message ever preached on this to study this out. You know, just a quick comment here. This has probably been preached through the years as one of the biggest doctrinal teachings in the Christian church, that someday all these things are going to happen. The problem with that is they already happen. That's the problem. The age ended. The temple was destroyed. And Jesus is king. Now that's already happened. There's not a Jew, Jewish system going back in place. Now, I do not believe that God's going to restore the old Jewish system at all. But we have a priest after the order of Melchizedek, after the order of an endless life. We have the eternal priest of God. Now, that's what I believe. And the temple of God is as we've read the last couple of weeks, is Christ and God. In the book of Revelation, they saw no temple there, but the Lamb and God in the Lamb. And I said a few weeks ago, I said, where did you go? Well, you're swallowed up in the Lamb. You're in Christ. That's where you went. You're in Him. He's in you. So we've dealt with that for two or three weeks. The The founding of the new house, the founding of the temple, the destruction of the old. But that question, now something, I, I shared this with Brother Dale this week. Why did they ask him about the sign of his coming? I never considered that. Why did they ask that question? What is the sign of your coming? Well, could be from the prophets. It could be from what Jesus had said to them. But I believe some of the things that he says to them that's recorded in John 14, if I understand, you know, the natural timelines of what Jesus is going to say to them in John 14, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you, there you may be also. I believe that happened maybe at the, what we call the Last Supper or in that period. So that may have happened after this discussion. Now, I'm not sure you'd have to lay all these things out, but, but just this question just arose up in my heart. Why did they ask him this? Because when Jesus told Peter he was going to the cross to die, <laughs> Peter for, for, began to forbid him. So here, here he's talking about coming again. Well, we, we assume we assume from our doctrinal views, or, or, or what most of us don't have this doctrinal view, maybe all of us here in this meeting, but we assume that they may know something about the coming of the Lord, but it just appeared in my heart, why did they ask him for the sign of his coming and the end of the age? Now, in the book, which I said I'm not probably not going to get into, I wrote, it's a, I believe it's a twofold sign. Maybe threefold. Some people think it's as simple as Jerusalem compassed about with the soldiers, and that 
very well may be part of it. And I'm not going to say it's not, but the Apostle Paul speaks of tongues as a sign. I don't know if you know if you've ever caught that in the book of Corinthians, and we're not we're not gonna fully go into that tonight, but I'm just gonna put it out here and one night we probably will. But the Assyrians, when they conquered Israel, they come in with another language in Israel and they throw overthrew the natural Israel. And and I believe the prophecy, I don't have all the prophecies before me, but I believe the prophecy in Isaiah speaks of them coming with another language or stammering lips and another tongue. And on the day of Pentecost, uh, the Holy Ghost came and it filled the house and they spake in new tongues. And Peter stands up and says, this is that which was spoken by Joel, that in the last days, Maybe that's a sign. The Holy Ghost himself is the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Just a strong belief I have, and I believe it so much I wrote out in what I wrote that this was part of the sign. The other thing I wrote in there that I believe is part of the sign, Jesus told him, said, there will be no sign given, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. Jonah, you know, was swallowed by the well, and he was three days, you know, uh, death, speaking of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and, and in the midst of Israel, before any of these things begin to take place, what happened? Jesus died, was buried, and raised from the dead, and shortly after his ascension, I think it was maybe 10 days, I believe, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house. Now, now notice that in Matthew 24, it speaks the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Well, the sound of the Holy Ghost was from where? Heaven. And John told you, the John the Baptist said that Christ was going to pour out what? The Holy Ghost. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And there on the day of Pentecost, what comes? Holy Ghost and fire. <laughs> what John said happened. And, and that was a heavenly sound. I, I believe, folks, me, I believe in speaking in unknown tongues. If you've been around me, I believe it. I speak in tongues. I've been filled with the Spirit in speaking tongues. I still believe it with all my heart today. It's like one of these things that I don't know when, when it happens to you, it's like you can't undo it. <laughs> it you know, somebody comes and tells you, well, that ain't real, Brother Wayne. Well, it's real to me, so okay. But also what they begin to declare, even in the natural, what, what Peter and Paul and those apostles were declaring, was a heavenly language. Ears and eyes hadn't seen what Peter and Paul began to declare in the book of Acts and on through their epistles. They began to speak from the Spirit of God. So their language even, you, you know, and, and part of me believes that the unknown tongue that we speak in is speaking, is even speaking of that. That, that it's a heavenly language, and what we're declaring of Christ, when we declare Christ by the Spirit, is a heavenly language. We, we speak the mysteries of God. We speak the mysteries of God that are made known by the Spirit of God. Okay, That's what we do. So this, this will be the introduction for the sign of his coming, and we'll probably look at this for you know, a few weeks like we did the other scripture. So what I want to zero in on tonight is, is in Matthew 24, as you look at this, you know, it goes down and you are, it says, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. It was Jesus says, and Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. See that man not deceive you. 
I was in a meeting uh, a few years ago when I left the meeting. And I believe it really set up on me when I left the meeting. It may have set up in the meeting. But this scripture just come at me, see that man doesn't deceive you. No man. All right. Now there, the reason they didn't want to, Jesus was warning them not to be deceived, was if they were deceived in that day, that very day that he was in, they were going to die in Jerusalem. Okay. Just taking the spiritual context out of it for a moment. If they believed man in that day, what was going to happen to them is they were going to die in Jerusalem. But what the Lord emphasized to me a few years ago is see that man does not deceive you. See, man will deceive you. Natural man will deceive you. The carnal mind can deceive you. And man, men do it all the time. Men are deceived all the time. Not intentionally. People many times probably deceive people without meaning to intentionally deceive them, but nonetheless, they do. To believe things. But in that day, if you believed the wrong thing, you were going to die physically because of what was coming upon that generation the reason i i'm emphasizing that generation jesus said this generation not our generation i mean we're the generation of the lord if we understand the spirit of god we're the missing generation that's in the book of matthew there's a missing generation which is the church and that's who we are we're the generation of the lord a seed shall serve him and shall be a generation unto the Lord, it says in the book of Psalms, and that's the church, his body. But that generation that he was speaking to, that all these things were going to happen, was the generation that was up on the earth when Jesus was speaking. I've heard preachers stand up and say, well, we're that generation. I want to say to them, well, you don't want to be that generation, brother. You don't want to be that because what was coming up on them was destruction. Everything, all the wrath or all the judgments, all the plagues from the old covenant was coming up on them that did not receive Jesus as the Christ. In fact, according to Historians, Josephus, uh, one of the famous uh, Jewish historians, he said that the, that the Christians fled Jerusalem when they saw the armies come past the city. Jesus told them to. He, he told them when you see Jerusalem surrounded, don't Go back. Get out. That's what he said. And pray your flight be not in winter. Pray you not be with child. Get out. For this is the day of vengeance. Okay. So what does all this mean? There's so much to break apart here. What does, all, what, what does all this mean? See that man not deceive you. Well, if you do a little bit of research, you'll find out that in that day, and, and, and you, 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 know, you, you say, well, Wayne, you need to uh, substantiate it by the Bible, and I, and I agree with that. So I will. I'll substantiate it by the Bible. In that day, in the book of Acts, it speaks, Acts 5.34, it says, 
Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space and said unto them, you men of Israel, take heed to yourselves that what you intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thaddeus, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain. And all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this, man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of taxing and drew much people after him. He also perished. And all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone, for if this counsel or work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to fight against God. Now, now think on this. So if you study history, these are two examples. If you study the history just a little bit, you will find out that there were a group of zealots that rose up in Jerusalem, and they deceived the people. What's interesting, I, I wrote this down in my notes. I have to find it because I took a lot of notes. But one of the zealots, you know, Jesus says there in Matthew to, to uh, there shall rise false Christ and false prophets in verse 24 and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I've told you before. Wherefore, if they say to you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. All right. Well, what, what I read in, in uh, some of the, I'm, I'm looking for it because I took a, took a bunch of notes and I may not find it, but I'll find it and give it to you if you want it. One of the zealots convinced about 4,000 people to follow him into the wilderness or desert and die, and they die. And I read this, and I went, oh, my goodness, Jesus told them <laughs> to go not after them. And, you know, and, and, and what, what, it, what it hit me with was, man, this, was, this became specific. And then another one of these zealots, Eventually, uh, you, you, you know, went into uh, this it was after the destruction of the temple, but he went into uh, uh, maybe the inner chambers into Herod's house, what the Jews had left, if you read history, and made a fortress there, you could say in the inner chambers. Another one thought he was the king, set himself up as like the D Davidic king as the, the Messiah. Some of them called themselves Messiah. And you start reading this and you go, wait a minute. This happened to Jerusalem. And why it happened and what gets alarming to me, I'm going to tell you what gets alarming, okay, is that these people, what, what a lot of these zealots did is they wanted a war. They wanted a king like David that would come back in and set back up the rule and authority of the Jews. You know, if you, if you read what, what it said about them, they were saying they wanted to worship none but the true God, but how they were going to bring it about, one of the particular zealots was by force, like David. They were going to overthrow Rome. Why this is alarming is a lot of God's people that are even born again people want to set back up a Davidic king kingdom, a natural kingdom that rules the world. Now that's alarming because Jesus comes on scene and says, "My kingdom's not of this world." So the heavenly kingdom is coming, another kingdom, another, 
another reality that man had known that I hadn't seen and ear hadn't heard, you know, is in the prophets, but it had to be made understood by the Spirit. But this literally happened and deceived Jewish people. And it deceived them that hadn't received Jesus as the Messiah, according to the historians. And they died in Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed. The city was burned. And you start reading the history of this, and you go, my Lord, they were fighting not only the Romans, they begin to fight against each other. They begin to starve each other to death, murder each other. And you, and you read what Jesus said in Matthew 24, and you go, my Lord, they did, you, you know, they sold each other out. It's in the history books. But for some reason, we, we, we were never introduced to the history of the Jews. So we read this Bible, and I and I believe the Bible. Don't get don't you get me wrong. I believe the Word of God. I believe it is the Word of God, the inspired Word of God. But we read it without looking at history surrounding it. And because we've done that, we've it's allowed us to say, well, this is going to happen. And not have an understanding that upon that generation, that 40-year period between the AD 30 and AD 70, it happened. From about the time of Jesus' ministry to the destruction of the temples, about a generation, a 40-year period, and it come upon that generation just like Jesus prophesied. This generation shall not pass to all these things be fulfilled. And one of the most obvious things here that's just obvious is, is Jesus told, told them in Matthew 24 that, that they would, you know, be put to death. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted. Well, have you ever read the book of Acts? What did they do to the apostles? Did they not beat them? Did they not scourge them? Did they not afflict them? They kill, did they not kill James? Read the Bible. Stephen stoned to death. My Lord, this was happening. This unfolds right after Jesus ascends and the Holy Ghost comes and they begin to preach the gospel, what, what do they do to Peter and John when, when the man at the gate of beautiful is healed? Do they go run out with welcome arms and say, praise God, look at this miracle? What does the leaders of the Jews do? They're at war with the Lord and his Christ. I don't know that we get this, but they go they're wanting to shut down anything that is calling Jesus the Christ. They're at war with it. You know, when we read the scripture, wars and rumors of wars, you know, an obvious thing that happens is that Rome and Jerusalem go to war. That's obvious. And I believe that's part of what Jesus is saying. But also what's going on, I want to read you a few scriptures here of what's going on in this day, of wars and rumors of wars. There's a war against the Lord and his Christ. Do you know that? According to the scripture, they come against the Lord and his Christ. The kingdom of darkness, the powers, the rulers of that day. Now, in the book of Acts, just look at this briefly. Acts 4 1 says, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they lay hands on them and 
put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the, mor on the next day or the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Look at this. They're gathered together. And when they'd set them in their midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done unto the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Now, come on down in this chapter to verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the lord and against his christ for of a truth against thy holy child jesus whom thou hast anointed both herod and pontius pilate with the gentiles and the people of israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak the word by stretching forth thy hand to heal and signs and wonders may be done in the name of the holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken that they were assembled, where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. Now this comes out of Psalms 2. Why do the heathen rage? It was the leaders of the temple. The <laughs> Notice the heathen. Just leave that there. Then come on down to go to 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. It says, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 says, how be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the prince of this, princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, or have they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What would they not have done? See, in the crucifixion was their defeat. In the crucifixion, their power was taken away. No longer did the Jewish high priest have the power. Now, they practiced it. For a period of time. But it was over. Had they known it? Because what happened? What happened was Jesus raised from the dead. He's the high priest after the order of an endless life. He alone is the high priest. There will never be another high priest. And we are priests unto him. We are a royal, royal generation, Peter says, or a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. So here, the priesthood changed. Here, the whole thing changed. Had they known it, they would not have crucified him. So the crucifixion overthrew 
It not only defeated sin, it overthrew that system, that power, the, the powers of the earth. Think, think about it. There were powers in that old system. There's powers in that old system. If you go sit under that old system and they tell you how full of sin you are every week, what happens? You begin to believe that. But Jesus defeated all those powers. Jesus rose as the victorious king. So there were wars. Yes, natural wars and rumors of wars, but there was a, an onslaught, I believe, coming right against the very kingdom of God. And they thought that if they would kill the son, like Jesus said in the parable, he said, he asked him, he said, what will, what will the, you, you know, the Lord do to those servants that kill the son? So, and I believe uh, Matthew's gospel around chapter 21 and they, and they said he will utterly destroy them. And they perceived he was speaking to them. And he was. Because that was the generation he told them. He said, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets. So when you go into the Re book of Revelation, you see in the prophets being killed. Jesus told them Jerusalem is killing the prophets. That was sent to them. And you go back through your Bible, and lo and behold, you find it in your Bible. And then lo and behold, Jesus sends disciples. He sends apostles and prophets into Jerusalem, and they kill them. Now the blood is required of them. It was, it was that day, that time, that period. But whoever come into covenant with Jesus, whoever received the Lord, was acquitted. It's always been that way, was acquitted. Even in that day, they were acquitted. He that endures to the end shall be saved. Now, I have a new uh, a, an understanding of that that's not just talking about us enduring to the end of our physical life, but there was an endurance to the end right there in Jerusalem that they were to endure to everything Jesus said was complete. So Matthew 24 is historical and it's spiritual. I told you before, I don't believe it's just historical. I believe it's spiritual. I believe there's a spiritual comprehension of everything. But I believe there's a natural understanding. And if we have the proper natural understanding, we'll get the spiritual one. Because what comes out of, the, of what we see as the devastation, it's just like the devastation in the cross, what comes out of that is life. There are people today who want to do away with the cross. And I'm going to tell you, you cannot do away with the cross and have any salvation of the Lord. It won't work. That's deception. I'll be bold. That is pure deception. And that's what man does. He comes in. What did, what did Peter tell Jesus? Oh, you don't have to die. What did Jesus say to Peter? Oh, Peter, you're right. No, he said, get thou behind me, Satan. Thou lovest the things that be of what? Man. That old man, that whole Adamic nature. You love that. My Lord, the cross, the glorious cross, where we're able to put the mind, our own minds that betrayed us, we didn't even have to have somebody else come to betray us. Our own minds, our own thoughts, where we were, were able to go to death to the old man. Hallelujah. To be raised in the newness of life. My Lord, what can be more beautiful than this cross? Jesus coming and bearing my sin, bearing me on the tree. Raising from the dead, raising us in the life of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. That's, that's why it says, be careful. That's why I'm telling you, there, there's, a, there's a thing out here, you, you know, where we can get deceived. Well, well, the old man was not saved in salvation. It's a new man, neither male, female, Greek, nor Jew. And the substance of this new man is Christ. 
we're saved in him. He's our salvation. And it starts at the cross. And the cross isn't just the sticks of wood or the tree that Jesus died on, but it was Christ himself. That is the cross. That's how we cross over is in him. We pass from death to life. So when we look at these things in, in the book of Matthew, Matthew 24 and other places in, in Luke and Mark, he's dealing with a specific situation up on the earth. But it's like, I say it's both natural and I believe spiritual. It's like there'll be some here that won't taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And I'm probably not quoting that right. But John and some of the apostles never tasted, I think it was John, never tasted a physical death till all this came about. However, we don't taste of death, the death of the cross, till we see him coming. See, that has a very natural, natural conclusion. But when we see the Lord coming, when we see the revelation of him coming in the clouds of glory, coming in his kingdom, what do we taste of? We taste of his death. We begin to reckon ourselves to be dead under sin. So it, only, it doesn't just have a natural conclusion. It has a spiritual conclusion. It has a spiritual reality to it that we're dead with him. We're buried with him. We're crucified with him. We're raised with him. We live in this new life. This new life that he is. This new life that's of him. Yes, and it's when we taste this, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So, so that's why I say, yes, I believe in the historical fulfillment, but I believe in it, that, that he didn't just do this historically that we know it's naturally fulfilled. He did this because it was going to have a spiritual implication to our hearts. It was going to to be part of the word that changes us. You know, you know, I hear people say sometimes, well, that part of the Bible ain't for us. Well, I believe it all is. I believe it just has a natural, you know, natural substance to it, but it has a spiritual implication to us all. That's what I believe. Now, God can change my mind, and I'm all for him broadening my tent. Because it's way broader than it used to be. It has a, an understanding that it didn't used to have. And, it, and I want to believe it comes from the Lord. I don't want to teach you anything that I think. I'll be honest with you. I wish, I wish everything I thought would just be demolished of the Lord. I don't care what I think's right. I mean, that sounds bold, but I really don't. I want to know what God says. And I want to live in it. So I want to understand it by the Spirit of God. I want to understand it through the revealing of Christ. And I want God's people to. And I'm all for being corrected of the Lord. He's, he's shown me many times that I don't know what I'm saying. Or I don't have a full comprehension i've had the lord i told waverly this morning he's like written question marks in my heart many times it's been like a big question i'll read something and the big question mark will come before me. what does that mean and the beauty of that when the lord does that i i, I guess i get excited today because i believe he's going to show me you know, when, young, when I was younger, I probably just got frustrated. Well, I don't know. But now there's an expectation that God's actually going to show me what it means. He's going to give me an understanding, and then he's going to give, empower me to live in it or him to live in me. And that's what this teaching on Matthew 24 of him, him removing that old system from the earth, him removing that old age and bringing forth the new age is really, to my heart, what I really want people to see is not just he removed it and their doctrine's wrong, but I want them to see this glorious new light that began to shine. That was shining in the apostles' heart as they were declaring the kingdom of God in the earth. 
that was bringing people into the life of Jesus Christ. And that that old system never had the power to do it. But now Christ in you through the spirit of God has the power to bring you into his glorious life. That's what I want us to see in this. That the spirit of God just illuminate our being. Well, I'll stop here tonight. We will continue, Lord willing, next week. And uh, Brother James Register will be sharing Tuesday night. God bless you. And I'm going to start with uh, Brother uh, Dale.